Racing on the Enduro World Series will always necessitate a level of risk many people won't be comfortable with. Race courses are littered with roots seeking to undermine traction and control. Rocks seem keen to inflict damage on man and machine. But if you're looking to be amongst the fastest mountain bikers in the world, the real risk is not taking any risk at all. When can a racer actually say, I've made it? The first pro contract? Their first win on the world stage? Or is it something more subtle? A sensation that sneaks up on them? A realization that they're a long, long way from where they started from. Look at him! Like someone off a rap album cover. As you can see, my bike's nicely parked there behind me as well. I remember that bike well. So when I was young, like, bikes was just all we did. I grew up watching my dad race. He raced motorbike enduro. <laughs> Get the polish off. <laughs> so when Greg was uh, growing up, he would have been around quite a lot of uh, motorbikes when I was racing. He was up to his mischief from a very young age with his uh, little bicycle, and then he would have had all his uh, motocross gear on. His upbringing was completely around two wheels, I would say. My first trials helmet. I remember my shoulders used to always be really sore because the helmet would like sit down on my shoulders. And when I was riding, I always had to like hold the helmet up with my shoulders. <laughs> so it fits me now. I got this as an eight-year-old. Did not fit me then. <laughs> Here's a good shot of that helmet. Matched the bike pretty well though. Look pretty factory. <laughs> Here's one of Dad's old custom paint jobs. God knows where it was. A real factory custom green Irish team paint job. The Calhoun name will be very well known. Uh, all of us have uh, competed in motorcycle events at some stage. He's got a lot of stories. And you know, as he always says, the older he gets, the faster he was. I don't get any bigger either. There you go. Jesus. Former Irish Enduro champion. Yes. Callahan. There you go. Took the over 40 class. He does what, 30 years ago? Yeah, 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 well, yeah. My parents were heavily involved in motorcycle sport. And then Greg obviously has taken over, so the last few years obviously he's been looking after him and see what we can do to help him in any small way. My dad, he always raced at a high level, but he never quite made that extra step, you know, to go professional and to go international. When he didn't, he stayed at home, and I think that, you know, it kind of made me want to say, right, I don't want to not take the chance. If I have half a chance, I'll do it. By the time I get to 23, if this isn't working out, maybe start thinking about another option. Thankfully, when I was 22, I turned professional, so I didn't have to do that. Only 0.5% of racers are ever given a chance to go from privateer to full factory support. But if you talk with this elite group of riders, they're quick to let you know that, in fact, chances aren't given. Chances are taken. Hey, Remy. Remember that time five years ago when I told you that making it as a pro EWS racer would be really, really <laughs> tough? Well, I told Tristan that I was gonna go race some EWS and uh, he said, well, Rem, it's gonna be tough. You know, you're gonna get out there and you're gonna race your heart out and you're gonna come 50th and kind of just the same as a World Cup. I said, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Straight through the floor, I'm falling in. When I came into Enduro, I was lucky enough to kind of get some support from a factory team. So 
so it is challenging when uh, the results aren't coming. So I've had a steady upward trend over my enduro career, which has been good for motivation. There's no magic dance, no magic ritual that you can do that'll uh, give you a cool head on race day to perform. It's something that from one week to the next can change. An Olympic-sized pool is exactly 50 meters in length. Track and field always takes place on a 400-meter oval. But weather, time, or the hard graft of trail builders will change the ribbons of dirt we ride and race on. That's one of the truly unique things about mountain biking. It's not just riders that have potential for progression. I love Derby. It's uh, one of my favorite places we've gone to. So round two, again, another repeat round from the 2017 season in Derby, Tasmania. When we came in the first year in 2017, there was actually nothing. We came back in 2019 and there was loads of new accommodation, maybe five or six bike shops. And you could see that the town was actually living for mountain biking. It creates such a cool vibe, you know, everyone in the town, so stoked to see us riding there and racing there. Kind of reminds me of home because it's granite rock, which is the same as home. And then, you know, the Australians are quite like the Irish in their mannerisms and their humour. Can I get a horn, please? Yes, yeah, you can get a horn, Greg. Thank you. <laughs> Put so many people on track. They're all crazy. After 2017, I was leading the race and coming up to the last stage. I famously shot myself in the foot. Yeah, I think you're, you're seven's real short. You're not going to win the race, but you can certainly lose it there. And uh, that's exactly what I did. I crashed and lost the race. Sometimes you're in the right frame of mind and you can do certain things, and then other times it just comes over you and it's, it's pretty hard to fight off the demons of pressure. <laughs> We say, OK, it's race day, let's go full gas. But it doesn't really work that way. You have to prepare before that, and then after, you have to manage everything during the, the race, which is hard to do. Like, sometimes it's race day, and you're like, ah, let's go full gas. And then uh, after three corners, you, uh, you have a flat tire, like uh, me in Tasmania. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> I'm going to fix this shit, put a tube in, then I'm going to go stage after stage. When it comes to racing enduro, you can outwork your competition or outplan them. But the counterintuitive key towards locking in good results is to outrelax them. Guys like Martin, he doesn't take anything too seriously, it seems. In enduro, I think that that can be pretty important because there is so much racing and you have to be on your game for eight hours in a day. You can't be the serious guy for eight hours. It's just exhausting. Having that mindset works pretty well in this sport. Ah, ah. We've got the other stage out of the way, so I'm pretty happy uh, how everything is going so far. Finished the day in fourth place, which was pretty awesome results as well. That was actually my career best. I was a little bit under pressure because I knew I was leading for the last stage, so you don't want to fuck it up. It was a good weekend for us again, and uh, we're on the roll. It's bittersweet because I'd love to be on the podium, but it means that experience is coming together. Now, finally, I'm able to ride my bike fast. I had a bit of a crash, I changed my line base, my head cam wasn't the one. <laughs> but I enjoyed it, held a fun, fun day. His determination is second to none and dedication is what got him to where he is today. 
starting out in mountain biking when he had no money and without his determination, he would never go any further, I don't think. The Enduro World Series is full of exotic locations, epic trails, and great people. But all that comes with the realization that on race day, a certain percentage of your final result will always be determined by the gods of chance. Now, with two races of the season in the books, the question still lingers as to exactly how far determination and daring can take you. Next on On Track. You have to have fun. Like, I've always believed fun is fast, and fast is fun. This is a group of men learning to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go up. We're here at round three in Madeira, and I'm sitting here doing this interview with my foot in a boot. 